President Dr. LaRosa, Mr. Littnesser, uh, Councilman Eugene, uh, Mr. Richards, Mr. Harrell, who's actually responsible for me being here, uh, and everyone. It is absolutely my pleasure to be here at the 34th year, as we've said over and over, but it needs to be said again. 34th year celebrating Black History Month here at SUNY Downstate. For three years, uh, from 2005 to 2008, I commanded a wing at Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland. And a wing is basically a small city. You have several thousand personnel, and it's self-sufficient. You have security forces and engineers and maintenance and, uh, of course, pilots to fly the aircraft. But we also have medical personnel. And 25%, one out of four of my personnel were medical personnel, which was somewhat unique for the Air Force. I had one squadron, and, and a squadron is made up of anywhere from 100 to 200 people. One squadron was there to care for our personnel there in the wing, to make sure that we were fit for duty and that we were fit and ready to deploy. A second squadron deployed to care for our wounded warriors on the ground at remote locations and set up temporary hospitals to ensure that they would be okay until they were transported to a more permanent facility. And then my third squadron were made up of medical professionals that basically transformed our aircraft into flying ambulances and transported our wounded warriors to the permanent hospitals. And I told them all the time, in my opinion, there is no greater profession than saving lives. <laughs> And I share that with you today also, and I thank all of you involved in this wonderful institution for what you do every single day to save lives. I was visiting your website once I received the invitation, and so I wanted to learn all about SUNY Downstate, and, and I love the fact that I was able to watch the video of Mr. McCall on the SUNY Board of Trustees, <laughs> who received your first Martin Luther King Leadership Award. And he talks about how his relationship with SUNY dated back to 1963 with the demonstration for employment justice here. And, uh, and I thought that was absolutely spectacular. And the, and the year 1963 kind of struck with me because it was uh, 20 years later in 1983 that an event happened here in New York that basically changed uh, my path in life, basically gave my, my path more direction. Um, I do have family here in New York City, though. I have family as close as Canarsie, which I believe is not too far away. But in 1983, uh, I was stationed at Hill Air Force Base in Utah, and an airman came up to me, and he says, hey, you're getting ready to go to pilot training. I was getting ready to go to pilot training in two months. He says, you should go to the Tuskegee Airmen Convention. He says, you know who they are, don't you? And I go, well, of course I do. They're our first black World War II pilots. And he says, well, you should go. And understand that for someone saying, you should go to a Tuskegee Airmen Convention, it's like someone saying, well, you're familiar with Denzel Washington, aren't you? <laughs> well, you should just go to the Academy Awards and meet him. <laughs> it was so over the top, I thought, could I really reach out and meet and touch and have conversations with my heroes? And they're like, yes. Well, that convention, uh, was held right here in New York City at what was the World Trade Center. And as you can imagine, I was giddy. And I would go up to, to all the airmen, I would just go, oh, thank you so much for paving the way. You know, I'm standing on your shoulders. I promise I'll make you proud. You know, I'm getting ready to go to pilot training. I was just, I was a groupie, I really was. And, and I basically have been ever since. And in addition to being in the presence of airmen from all over the nation, I really made fast and close friends with a number of airmen here from New York City. So airmen like Dr. Roscoe Brown, Percy Sutton, <laughs> uh, Lee Archer, who pinned me to Colonel, uh, Nancy Lieutenant Cologne, our first African-American uh, woman nurse in the armed uh, forces, uh, was among the Tuskegee Airmen that pinned me to General. Uh, <laughs> That was pretty awesome. So New York has a near and dear place in my heart. And to be in the presence of those heroes and sheroes really kind of charted my path in flying. 
And I tell people, I am the proud daughter of a career enlisted father, just like your father was in the military. And there are so many veterans here, and I thank you and spouses of veterans. Thank you all for your service. And I would tell people, when my father went to work, he wore a light blue shirt and dark blue pants. And every two years, we traveled to another what I thought was an exotic location. <laughs> and I thought, when I grow up, I'm going to be just like my dad. And so that was my goal. I knew I wanted to be in the Air Force but mainly to travel, you know, when the outfit was easy, so I could do that. <laughs> well, when my dad retired from the Air Force, he retired out at McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey, and then because the family home is North Carolina, Warrington and Henderson, uh, he decided that uh, he would move the family to Fayetteville because Fayetteville had Pope Air Force Base there, he could take advantage of the retiree benefits, and he could also go to college. My father always wanted to complete college, and Fayetteville State was there. So while my dad was a freshman through senior at Fayetteville State, I was a freshman through senior in high school. So we graduated together. So that was pretty special. Well, while in high school, uh, my high school had junior ROTC. And I said, well, I know I want to be in the military. I want to be just like my dad. So I'll enroll in junior ROTC, which I did. And I began to learn a little bit more about the military and the Air Force and how to be a good citizen and how to work, with, work as a team, work with the team, and built a lot of leadership skills. And so I realized that I really had a passion beyond just wanting to travel around the world. I really had a passion to serve our nation, and Junior ROTC was leading me on that uh, path. So I applied for an ROTC scholarship, which at that time paid for your entire education. And I said, wow, if they're going to pay for my entire education, I'm going to get out of North Carolina. Nope, nothing wrong with North Carolina. <laughs> but I was born in California, and I said, I'm just going to go out west to go to school. So I applied for the scholarship, applied to colleges all over the country, and, uh, and I received the word that I was an alternate for the scholarship, which basically meant if someone didn't take their scholarship because they went to a service academy or, or just decided not to, uh, to be in, uh, in the military, that I would be amongst the next people on the list to be selected. Well, we're about a month prior to starting college, and I hadn't gotten any word. And so the bottom line was I knew my parents couldn't afford to send me out of state. And so when I applied to North Carolina State University in Raleigh, and, uh, and so I started college there. As soon as I arrived at NC State, I got the word, you've been approved for your scholarship. So I was like, yay! However, it was too late to transfer anywhere right then. And so I said that, uh, you know, I would transfer my sophomore year to, to Southern Cal, which is what I did. But it was really special that I was there at NC State because uh, my first year of college was 1977, and that was the first year that the Air Force was allowing women in college to apply for pilot training. And fortunately, I had an instructor who was progressive enough and just forward thinking enough to approach me and say, would you like to compete for this scholarship? He says, do you like to fly? I go, of course I like. I've been flying all my life. My dad's in the Air Force. And he said, well, how would you like to be the pilot? And I said, of course I would. <laughs> Why be a passenger when you can fly the plane yourself? So I competed for that scholarship, and I was accepted right away. And I was always thankful for him for exposing me to that opportunity because that's the key. And that's why the youth is here. You're hearing about different opportunities that are available to you. Had he not mentioned it, I would not have known. You know, you don't know what you don't know. And so exposure is absolutely the key. So I was on my way. So you would have thought from the moment I was selected for pilot training that I had been born with wings. It's all I ever wanted to do. It's all I dreamed about. That's how I learned about the Tuskegee Airmen and Bessie Coleman and everybody who came before us and the WASPs during World War II, our female pilots in the military, and I was, I was pretty all consumed with flying. In my sophomore year, I transferred out to Southern Cal. And I'm a diehard Trojan. I really am. Uh, and I went into the new ROTC program. And the leadership there, honestly, was not as receptive of me being a pilot as they were at North Carolina State. But they inherited me, so, you know, I was going to go through the program regardless, yeah. <laughs> so that was their issue. That was not mine. <laughs> well, my senior year, uh, you take a commissioning physical to make sure you're fit for duty. 
And when I took my commissioning physical, my eyes did not pass. And so at the time, you had to have perfect 2020 vision for the military. And uh, for someone who had only known for four years that they were going to pilot training, once again, I was devastated because, you know, I just saw my wings kind of wilting. And I thought, what in the world is, you know, what am I going to do? I mean, I know I, I can be an engineer, but I, I want to fly aircraft now. So I reached out to the medical board and I said, what can I do? And they said, well, you know, this happens every now and then. You've been studying for four years. Your eyes are a little bit weak. You know, three weeks, take three weeks, retest, and if your eyes pass, you're back on track. I thought, okay, I'm back on my path to flying, so I'm happy. So I tried to rest my eyes as much as I could, and they were just barely off 20-20 uh, vision, and so I took the supplemental physical, and my eyes passed, and I was like, yes, my path, I'm back on my path again. Minor deviation, a little bit of an off-ramp, but I'm back on now, so now I'm going to pilot training. Well, now weeks are going by and we're getting closer to graduation and, and members of my class that also had pilot slots, the guys, they were all getting their assignments to pilot training, which base you were going and when you were going, and I still hadn't received mine. So a couple of weeks are going by and all of a sudden I am the only pilot candidate that does not have an assignment. So I reach out to my unit and I said, uh, do, you know, do you know what's going on? And they go, no, we, we have no idea what's going on. So I said, okay, so I contacted the medical board and I said, hi, you know, this is Cadet Harris and was just checking on my medical. The rest of my classmates already have their assignments and they said, well, uh, you're not going to pilot training. And I said, why not? They said, because we never received your supplemental physical. And I said, well, of course you did. I took the physical, I gave all the paperwork to my unit and they submitted it to you. They said, well, that did not happen. We do not have your paperwork. And at this point, it's too late. You know, there's a cutoff. They've already assigned all the pilot training slots. There aren't any more. And they said, so you will have to go on active duty as an engineer. Now, what happened in the, in the meantime was kind of unpleasant for those involved that, that did not submit my paperwork, but they were dealt with. <laughs> That's a whole other story for the book. <laughs> but the bottom line is I was told that I would go on active duty as an engineer and that uh, if I wanted and I took the physical again and my performance was good, I could reapply all over again for pilot training. So I said, okay, that's fine. So my first assignment was Hill Air Force Base in Utah. And I thought, wow, this is kind of unique. <laughs> so I went, to, uh, I went to Utah and just had an absolutely spectacular time. And I told my boss, I said, you know what? I will do the absolute best job I can do for you. I will work as hard as you possibly want me to work and beyond because I want to serve you well in this organization. I said, and if you in return would just support me in my quest to go to pilot training, I would really appreciate that. And he says, if you do your part, you know, I'll do mine. We'll put your paperwork through the board. We'll get all the appropriate recommendations. It took about a year and a half because you have to have demonstrated performance once you're on active duty. You just can't apply like you did in college. So I waited a year, demonstrated my performance, and he supported me. I reapplied for the board, eyes passed the physical, and then I was selected for pilot training again. So I was like, yay, back on course finally. A year and a half later, that's okay. Two lessons I learned in charting my path. Persistence pays off. It really, really does. You have to be focused. You got to chart your path. You got to, like we say, you got to fly your aircraft. You know, no one can take that from you. And then secondly, God's delays are not his denials. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was a little bit disappointed I didn't get that scholarship right away so that I could go straight to the West Coast to go to school. But because I did go to NC State, because that instructor was willing to expose me to that opportunity to fly. That may not have happened had I gone straight to the other ROTC unit. You know, I was hoping to go obviously straight into flying, but I had great uh, support experience in Utah. You know, I learned that it takes more than just pilots to fly an aircraft. You know, it takes an entire city. It takes all those functions, all those support functions that help you in your ability to accomplish your mission to fly. And lastly, had I not had that year and a half delay, I wouldn't have met that airman at Hill Air Force Base in Utah that said, 
Are you familiar with the Tuskegee Airmen? You, you should go to their convention. That would have never happened for me, and I would not have met the Tuskegee Airmen right then, uh, because they have been such a driving force uh, in my life. They are my role models. They are basically uh, my extended family. So God's delays are not his denials. You know, all my little off-ramps, that's okay. Little bit of deviation, that's okay. Because in the end, I believe I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> And just like you saying, how great thou art. <laughs> My goal has always really been to make the Tuskegee Airmen proud and to seize the opportunities that weren't afforded to them. You know, they, they weren't uh, afforded the opportunity to become commercial airline pilots, even though they were more than aptly qualified. But more importantly, my goal has been to pay my blessings forward, to mentor and groom those who are following uh, in my footsteps and also in their careers. And as they say, the rest is history. In 1990, I separated from active duty and was hired by United Airlines. Now, my father wasn't very happy about this, because once again, my father was career, you know, and he was getting that retirement check. And I had eight and a half years, and my father was like, oh, this is not good. <laughs> he says, you know what, you're, you're almost halfway there. You know, in, in 12, 11 and a half more years, you can have a retirement, you know, and then you can go do whatever you want. I don't think that's a good idea. And I was like, well, Daddy, it was really the, the heyday of airline hiring. I said, Daddy, I can still, you know, be in the reserves. And he's like, okay. Well, then I took my father on a trip with me to Europe. And as he's sitting in first class, drinking a glass of champagne, my dad says to me, it was the best decision you ever made. <laughs> I thought so, Dad. <laughs> but still wanting to serve uh, in the Air Force and have a career just like my dad did, I continued my service in the Air Force Reserve. Once again, where my greatest passion is mentoring and taking care of our airmen who every day put their lives on the line to defend this great nation in which we live. I'm so thankful to have crossed so many of their paths in the ground and in the air. And it's funny, when we fly, as I've talked about, we're always making small corrections. When you fly, you're never on a straight path. And you make corrections due to turbulence, due to weather, due to reroutes, hopefully never due to other aircraft in your way. So our course is never in a straight line. We're always correcting back to center line. And the same holds true in life. You know, rarely do you stay on your charted path, but you've got to keep the path in mind. You don't allow uh, distractions, naysayers, a little bit of turbulence to get in your way. You've got to fly your aircraft, because if you don't fly your aircraft, the airplane goes out of control. So it's on you. The path that Tuskegee Airmen paved was new and uncharted. They fought long and hard not just to fly, but to allow us to have racial justice, not in our military, uh, but in our nation. They knew at the end of the day that they needed to fly their aircraft. That's what they needed to do. Fly your aircraft, stay on your path, and they did. And in doing so, the men, the women, the officer and enlisted, the support personnel and the flyers changed the course of our nation's military and our nation as a whole. So if you're looking for a sense, uh, source of inspiration uh, to chart your path, there's still time. Go out and support and see Red Tails. How many of you seen Red Tails? Yay! <laughs> see our American heroes uh, in action. The president in the State of the Union address stated, there's no challenge too great, no mission too hard, as long as we're joined in common purpose, as long as we maintain our common resolve, our journey moves forward, and our future is hopeful. Chart your path, fly your aircraft. There's no challenge too great or mission too hard. And my wish for you is that your journey is filled with great health, great relationships, and success. Thank you so much.